The Urtonwood Ghost by Eleanor Glynn Section 1, Chapter 1, Part A Mrs. Charters arrived at Euston in plenty of time for the train to Isleton. She was a woman who was well served, and her footman had already got her all that she required, and she retired with a paper to the farther side of the compartment. You need not wait, Thomas, she said. There will probably be no one else getting in, and it is a corridor train. So Thomas touched his hat and left. Just before the guard gave the signal to start, a man, evidently a gentleman, opened the door of the carriage and entered. He had been walking leisurely up and down the platform, and, if she had known it, had observed her maid and footman, looked at her luggage, and ascertained her destination. It was the same as his own, Urtonwood Manor, that really charmingly romantic old place Ada Hardress and her obedient husband had just taken from the Walworths for a year. It is too exquisitely ghostly, pet, she had written to Esther Charters. Creaking panelling, underground passages, haunted library, and a big cedar wood bedroom where the white lady appears. There is no electric light, and a person with your sensibilities can be perfectly certain to receive a thrill. Come and spend Christmas with us. And Mrs. Charters had accepted, won by this alluring description, and was now, the day before Christmas Eve, on her way thither. She was a tall, slender woman of twenty-eight or thirty, perhaps. She was not beautiful, but every single thing she put on seemed to enhance her grace. Rather plaintive and distinguished refinement appeared to be the note which first struck strangers about her. That boar, Algernon Alexander Charters, had joined friends in another world some three years before this Christmas Eve, leaving his widow most comfortably provided for. Only, an unpleasant jar had happened not more than a week ago. The family lawyer had written to inform Esther that there might be serious trouble ahead, and it might even eventualize in her loss of most of Algernon Alexander's money, if a certain marriage certificate could not be found. The whole fortune was being claimed by a descendant of the great-great-grandfather, who contended that Algernon Alexander himself had enjoyed his ten or twelve thousand a year unlawfully. It appeared that somewhere about 1795, the rich alderman Charter's son, delighting to move in circles above him, had contracted a marriage secretly with the daughter of a decayed noble, who would have none of him. And the lady, regretting her mistake too late, had denied all connection with him, and willingly relinquishing her son, whose existence she had concealed, and of whom she was ashamed, she had retired with her father to Italy, and there, a year or two later, had died, the wife of an Italian count. The abandoned, rich city husband had apparently taken the casual behaviour of the noble lady in a philosophical spirit, doting upon her son, to whom, although he married again and had a number of other children, he left the bulk of his great fortune. This second family seemed to have been complacent people and had accepted their fate. But now, one of their descendants had come forward and claimed that the will of John Charters expressly stating to my legitimate eldest son and his heirs, with no name given, the property should come to him as the lineal representative of the eldest son of the second family, there being no proof to be found anywhere of the first marriage with the Lady Marjorie Wildacre. 
Mrs. Charters thought of all these things as she sat in the train. Her attention had scarcely wandered from them, even as she glanced up at the intruder into her carriage. But she did casually notice that he was a thin, dark man with something rather attractive looking about him. And after a while, she became conscious that his eyes were fixed upon her, and she felt compelled to look up. They were too close together, the orbs which met hers, she decided, though their size and shape left nothing to be desired. She had a foolish shiver of foreboding and dislike as she turned away and let her mind revert to the ceaseless question of where on the face of the earth this certificate could be, and how were they to find it? Presently the stranger leaned forward and said, in a most cultivated voice, which yet had a foreign accent somewhere lurking in the background, you are Mrs. Charters, I believe? We are both going to the same house. May I introduce myself? I am Ambrose Duval. I am afraid not quite an Englishman. His smile was so pleasant it made you forget the sinister impression left by his eyes. Mrs. Charters was of the world and not easily disconcerted. She bowed politely, and a conversation began, in the course of which it became apparent that Mr. Ambrose Duval, such a name, it reminds one of Claude, she thought, had met the Hardresses abroad, and had renewed his acquaintance lately, and was coming down now to this Christmas party. Nothing could be more polished and smooth than his manner had that easy gliding from one subject to another which makes so agreeable a conversationalist. He skimmed all sorts of interesting topics, and at last arrived at English architecture. Burtonwood is a very romantic old place, Mrs. Hardress tells me, he said, a fine specimen of Tudor style, with additions of Jacobean. I am longing to study it. Do you know its history? Not in the least, Esther replied. My friend, Ada Hardress, really wrote I should be certain to see ghosts. I love the thought of them, although I have never been fortunate enough to encounter one. Have you? And she smiled her fascinating, elusive smile that was half melancholy and half gay. Sir George Seafield who had already arrived at Urtonwood earlier in the day, thought Esther Charter's smile the most divine thing in the world, but then he was in love, resentfully so at first, then resignedly, and now abjectly. Ambrose Duval, on the contrary, mused, she's no fool for all her gentleness, a capable mouth. Perhaps her innocence about Urtonwood is all bluff, and she is bent upon the same errand as myself. I must lose no time. By four o'clock, when they had reached Isleton, they had each taken stock of the other. He makes me creep down my back, was Mrs. Charter's comment, although I do feel he is attractive. Some more guests got out of another carriage, and there were greetings and chaff, and the whole party entered motors and were whirled to their destination. Here all was holly and mistletoe and everything to make a real English Christmas, huge log fires in every grate, and quantities of wax candles tried to make up for the want of electric light. Nothing could have looked more like a storybook description of things as they were once in the good old days. Ada Hardress gave her friend a most gushing welcome, and contrived that Sir George Seafield secured a chance for a word with her in a suitable window seat as they drank tea. 
You are cruel to me, he said, looking devotedly at the lady of his heart with his keen blue eyes. Promising to be at the junction and never turning up by that train, I came down from Scotland on purpose and thought I should have been allowed to take care of you from crew here. I can take care of myself, she protested softly, and I found I wanted to shop this morning before I left. You think you are capable of looking after yourself always, under any circumstances, I suppose, he hazarded. But of course, and when I feel I cannot, then I shall tell you. And she smiled. I pray fate to let the chance come sooner than we think, he announced fervently. But at this pious hope, Mrs. Charters only looked sweetly disdainful and changed the conversation to less personal things. You won't be a goose, darling, and snub Sir George to death, will you? Ada Hardress begged as she took her friend up the stairs. You are so provoking with your aloof air, and now wanting to rest until dinner when he is dying to talk to you. But Mrs. Charters was unimpressed. I am really tired, Ada, and it does Englishmen good to be made to wait. I learned that in America, she said. Algernon took me there when I wanted to go to Rome, but I never regretted it. I acquired so many hints from those clever women. Oh, what a heavenly place, she added, when they got to the cedar chamber, which had been allotted to her. Fancy it's not having been spoilt in these modern days. For it was all panelled and hung with faded orange silk in its three tall windows and capacious four-post bed. End of section one. Section two of the Ertonwood Ghost by Eleanor Glynn. Chapter one, part B. And presently, when Mrs. Charters was tucked up upon the rather hard sofa, preparing to have a siesta before dinner, she felt at peace with all the world. It was not long before she was sound asleep and here she had a strange dream. She felt herself unaccountably moved and perturbed. She had a sensation of breathless, waiting tension while she stood in some dark place, and suddenly it seemed as though only one spot in the blackness became illuminated, and then she saw an old escritoire. There was nothing else, no furniture, no room, nothing but this old writing bureau standing in space, and there, on it, lay unfolded a yellow parchment, upon which seemed to have fallen some drops of fresh blood. Esther woke with a sensation of supernatural excitement and fear, and then she reasoned with herself, could anything have been more foolish? A dream with no incident, no personages, no action, to cause such a feeling. There was something uncanny about it, though. What if the room were really haunted? She was not sure she liked it after all. She got up quickly and rang for her maid, glad to have company and lights. But all the while she dressed, she saw nothing but the escritoire, the parchment, and the three drops of blood. You look pale and pathetic, Sir George Seafield told her, with tender anxiety in his voice as they went in to dinner. What has happened? I want to know. But it was not until about the first entree that he could get her to unfold her dream. Her other hand neighbour was the attractive whole foreigner who had come down in the train with her, and who had no intention of allowing her legitimate partner to monopolise the conversation. He listened attentively as she described minutely her strange incident to Sir George, 
bending forward so as not to lose a word, much to that gentleman's disgust. I hate the brute, he thought. Why cannot he attend to the woman he has taken in? What a very strange dream, Mr. Ambrose Duval said. And where was the escritoire? You have no idea? Not in the least, replied Esther. It was all in space. But why the blood? And then a thought struck her. Of course, she exclaimed. This is some vision sent to tell me where I am to find a most important document. How stupid of me never to have thought of it before. A, a document? document? Both men asked. But while Sir George's eyes only expressed deep admiration for the lady herself, Mr. Ambrose Duval's had a concentrated eagerness to hear her words that was arresting. Why should this interest him so? wondered Sir George, and it caused him to feel puzzled and irritated. Mrs. Charters was no chatterer, and not in the habit of imparting her private affairs to strangers, so she laughed and changed the conversation now to lighter things, dividing her time equally between the two men until the ladies rose to leave the room. Sir George Seafield was incensed. Why had his good friend Ada Hardress asked this foreigner to Urtonwood, and why had she put him next to Esther, the lady of his heart? I believe she is rather drawn towards the jackanapes, he angrily thought to himself, and with difficulty kept from sparring with him as they sat over the port. Ada, where did you meet Mr. Duval? Mrs. Charters asked as a group of women hung over the big drawing-room fire. He seems an interesting creature. Doesn't, Doesn't he? he? Several of them chimed in. Mysterious and delightful, one affirmed. So good-looking, another announced. His eyes are too close together, old Miss Harcourt said in her sententious way. I shan't play bridge with him. We met him in Hungary last summer, the hostess at last got in. It seems absurd, but he was an hotel acquaintance. Only he knew such a lot of people we did, he seemed like an old friend. And we saw him often and he was always cheery and nice. He has relations in England that he has come to look up. I am so glad you find him attractive. I do myself. He has been too charming this last fortnight, when we were up in town for Christmas shopping. He had just arrived from Paris, and I have never had so delightful a companion. So I asked him down for Christmas. He said he would be lonely, and is so absorbed in the study of old houses. Then someone began to play the piano, and the group broke up, and soon the gentlemen joined them, and a general move to the big oak-panelled hall commenced, when the younger member started a valse, while the fiddlers three who had come down from London to entertain the Yuletide guests, played merrily. Sir George Seafield was detained by the host for a second, and had the chagrin to see Mrs. Charters whirling in the arms of the foreigner. He shut his firm jaw with an ominous snap. I am dashed if I'll put up with it, he muttered, and went and claimed the next turn, the moment the pair paused for breath. Cross you look tonight, Sir George, Mrs. Charters said as they danced. My last partner was so agreeable and sympathetic. I want to wring his neck, was all the answer she got. And then he added, as they stopped and wandered off to a distant sofa in the gallery, I am sure he is up to no good. I'd watch the silver if I were Jack Hardress. It is really remarkable to what depths of spite men will descend about one another. Esther laughed as they sat down. No woman would be so transparent. And all just because Mr. Duval is a foreigner and has good manners and does not show moods. And she leaned back provokingly among the cushions. You like him? 
Sir George asked indignantly, and then aggrievedly. But anyone can see that. If you are going to be unpleasant, Mrs. Charters said, I shall leave you and dance with him again. He valses divinely. Sir George's eyes blazed. If you do, I will wring his neck. I could easily, he blurted out. Absurd brute force. And she smiled plaintively. Englishmen are so crude. How you do tease me, Esther, Sir George said, and then stopped suddenly. Who told you you might call me that? Mrs. Charters frowned. A piece of impertinence. But here her voice faltered, for she saw that her companion was no longer listening to her. His eyes were fixed with an intense interest upon a picture which hung upon the wall opposite them, the portrait of a lady in late eighteenth century dress, with a rather high waist and flowing white draperies, while her hair fell in ruffled, unpowdered curls. It was not by any celebrated artist, but was a pleasing picture, and as Esther's eyes took it in, she knew why Sir George was so absorbed, for it bore a most wonderful likeness to herself. By Jove, was all he said. It certainly might have been painted from me, she allowed. Who can it be? But they could not find out. The host, whom they questioned, did not know. He happened to be passing that moment, and joined them with his foreign guest. They had only taken the place from the Walworths for a year, he said, and the Walworths had bought it just as it stood, from someone else. It had changed hands once or twice, and he could not remember now which were the original owners. It is supposed to be a portrait of the ghost, I believe, he told them. Some old retainer informed Ada when we came. The white lady who haunts the library in the cedar chamber. Where I sleep, cried Esther with a note of distress. Oh, Jack, I believe I am half afraid. I'll come and watch outside your door if you are, said Sir George. Then you can call me if you feel frightened in the night. I will tackle any ghost for you. I should glory in the act. I do not doubt it, laughed the host, and discreetly walked on. But Mr. Ambrose Duval stayed behind, examining every turn of the brush in the picture with a critical eye. Esther had grown very quiet, Sir George noticed. She suddenly felt again that strange sense of excitement, a cold, unpleasant feeling of tension and dread she looked up into his face with an appealing pair of soft grey eyes. Let us go and dance again, she said. I want to get warm once more. I feel cold. And Sir George joyfully encircled her slender waist and held her close as they rejoined the dancers and whirled about. Who sleeps next to me? Mrs. Charters asked as a laughing group of women went up to bed about one in the morning. But she heard, with secret dismay, that the only other room in this quaint square wing was a sitting room with a little oratory attached. You always have said you adored ghosts and weird things, Mrs. Hardress said. Oh, dearest, I would not have put you in the cedar chamber. So I do, of course returned Esther, rather half-heartedly. She was a proud woman, and ashamed to show her fears. Everything looked most bright and comfortable when she got to her room, and her devoted elderly maid had waited up for her, and now put her to bed with every care. So, tired out with her dance, Esther forgot her sense of uneasiness and soon sank to sleep again, between the slippery, fine sheets, 
while the dying fire made flickering light in the vast room. But in the grey dawn she awoke in mortal fright, for she had dreamed again of the dark space, the escritoire, the parchment, and the drops of fresh blood. End of section two. Section three of the Urtonwood Ghost by Eleanor Glynn. Chapter two, part A. Next day was Christmas Eve, and much occupied with all sorts of bygone amusements, in which a Christmas tree for the children figured in the late afternoon. Everyone was particularly gay and cheerful. Only Esther Charters felt heavy as lead. Her dream haunted her. It had certainly some meaning. It was the second time she had experienced it, and the certificate the loss of which might make such a difference to her, could quite well look like the parchment on the desk. But why there should be any connection with it and this house, of which she had never heard until her friends had taken it, she could not imagine. And if there was some strange thread in it all, why should the picture of the ghost be like herself? The money she could be deprived of had been Algernon's money, and had not come to her through her own family at all. So it would be more sensible, and seemingly in sequence, if the ghost looked like him or one of her sisters-in-law. But she could not shake off the unaccountable depression she was filled with, and she tried to divert herself, with Mr. Ambrose Duval's inspiriting conversation, to the rage of Sir George who had left Scotland on purpose to be present at this party and press his suit, feeling full of hope that she would show him some grace. But for some reason all had been at sixes and sevens between them, and this hateful foreign man appeared to be the cause. Towards the end of the day, Sir George's temper had got the better of him, and he had finally gone off and talked to another woman, in pique and disgust. And so once more the night came, and Esther was left alone in the cedar room. Now the conduct of the foreign guest had excited suspicion, as well as fury, in the breast of Sir George, and he had watched him unconsciously most of the day. The brute had come to Urtonwood with some purpose. He now felt sure of that. Such extreme interest in all the rooms and the furniture was overdone, if it were really an innocent fancy for old things. The library in particular seemed to have attracted him, and he even contrived to be shown the famous cedar chamber, while he said most insinuating and admiring things to its present occupant. They had gone there, a company of four or five, after lunch, old Miss Harcourt among them, torn from her bridge. I would not sleep here for the world, she said. I wonder how you can, Esther. You must have nerves of iron, and a conscience of snow-like purity. It makes me feel creepy even in broad daylight. I am not afraid, affirmed Mrs. Charters, raising her head. From there the group had returned to the library and here Mr. Duval pointed to an old escritoire, which stood in one window, unused now as a writing table. Its surface seemed a good deal warped from the sunlight, which had come in upon it, probably for many years. This could be the one you told us about in your dream, Mr. Duval said, furtively watching her face. And Esther recognised that it was, indeed, the same, with a sharp thrill. But she laughed a little nervously as she evaded a direct reply. Mr. Duval was examining it closely, passing smooth, finely moving fingers over all its sides and top. There is probably some secret spring, he said. 
It would be amusing if your dream came true, and it disclosed the parchment and the drops of blood. But for some reason, Esther did not wish him to find it, if there was any spring. She would examine it herself another time, with Ada alone. And Sir George, watching now intently, felt all sorts of queer ideas come into his head. By the time they said good night, the feeling that there was something going on underneath grew so strong that he determined not to undress or go to bed. He is going to have a try at opening that old bureau. I'd make any bet, he said to himself, and I'll balk him if I can and discover what is up. So he pretended to be tired and go on to his room when the other men moved to the smoking room, which was in a side wing, after the ladies had left. But in reality, he waited until he thought the butler would have extinguished the lights in the library and the middle part of the house. And then he lit his candle and softly crept down and stretched himself upon a sofa, rather behind a screen while the dying embers of the fire gave a mysterious glow all over the rest of the room. And in the cedar chamber, Esther, tired out and rather saddened at the estrangement which she felt had grown up in the day between herself and her hitherto ardent would-be lover, got hastily to bed. It was her own fault, she knew, she had been most capricious, and talked far too much to the foreign man, whom she realized now she rather disliked underneath. She had been foolish and nervous and jumpy today, and she felt quite ashamed of herself. But in a very short time she grew sleepy, and all became a blank, until, with startling vividness, for the third time the dream returned again, and to it was added a dim figure which seemed to beckon to her and compel her to rise and follow from her warm, soft bed. It seemed that she crept across the room to a panel beside the fireplace, fascinated, but without fear, following the ghostly shape which when it turned its face, looked so strangely like herself. And the panel glided back, disclosing a dark opening, and still she was impelled to enter its black depths, and all the while she felt herself descending a narrow stair. A dim iridescence seemed, like a nimbus, to encircle the head of that faint wraith which was leading her on. Meanwhile, in the library, Sir George was almost dozing off to sleep on his sofa in the shadow of the screen. The clock had struck two, and the fire had burnt so very low that hardly even a glow now illumined the room, but a broad shaft of moonlight came in from the top part of the window to which the shutters did not reach. It was composed of small panes, with a coat of arms emblazoned in the centre, and the beams of the moon threw some weird shades upon the floor and upon the old escritoire which happened to stand in its path of light. Sir George thought to himself that he had, after all, perhaps been mistaken. The foreigner had probably gone to bed with the rest, and he, too, turn in, when, just as his meditations reached this far, he heard the faintest noise of the door opening, and someone, with stealthy footsteps, cautiously advance up the room. He felt, rather than saw, that it was Ambrose Duval, as he sprang to his feet. He was securely hidden in the black shadow of the screen. The man went softly to the shutter of the moonlit window, and with quiet, nervous
nerveless hands undid its old-fashioned bolt, letting in a still broader shaft of light, which now allowed every detail of the old bureau to be seen. Then he came eagerly to its side, and Sir George held his breath and leaned forward, not to miss anything of what might be going to happen. Mr. Duval seemed to be feeling the lid, which he opened with care, and then a search began for the secret spring, and once or twice, as he looked up as if for inspiration, his face seemed like a fiend's in the ashen light. At last he appeared to have discovered something. A drawer flew open with a jerk, and he gave a sharp exclamation of pain. Some part of the steel spring had evidently wounded his hand, but his hesitation was only momentary. With frantic eagerness he now drew forth a roll from the secret place. It looked to Sir George like an old yellow parchment, and as Ambrose Duval bent to scrutinize it, with devilish satisfaction upon his face, there dropped from the cut on his hand some drops of blood. The scene was the exact reproduction of Mrs. Charter's dream. Section 4 of The Ertonwood Ghost by Eleanor Glynn Chapter 2 Part B This was the moment, Sir George felt, for him to interfere, but before he could take more than a step, he was arrested by seeing the thief raise his head, and then start and grow livid, shaking with abject terror as he gazed into a far corner the parchment dropping from his nerveless fingers back onto the old desk. And Sir George, following the direction of his eyes, also experienced a thrill which, even in him, was not unmixed with something akin to fear. For both men could just distinguish, slowly and noiselessly advancing towards them out of the shadows, from a part of the room where there was no door, the tall, slender figure of a woman in a rather short-waisted white garment with ruffled curls of unpowdered hair. She seemed to be ethereal and unreal, but when she got into the moonlight, the likeness was unmistakable. The face was the same as the picture in the gallery, which the host had told them represented the Ertonwood ghost. The great grey eyes were wide and staring, like the eyes of a corpse, and the whole figure moved slowly, with a gliding motion unlike life. My God, is it Esther? Sir George gasped to himself, as he waited the turn of events. If it were his well-beloved, and she must be walking in her sleep. If the denizen of some other world, then something strange and awful might develop when she got to the escritoire. In either case, his best course would be to watch and be ready to spring. For he fully realized the securing of the parchment was, to Ambrose Duval, for some reason, a matter of desperate need. The figure advanced, growing more clear as it reached the goal. Duval was now crouching, an almost inert mass, some paces drawn back, in mortal fright. The lady, whoever or whatever she was, put out a transparent-looking hand in the moonlight, and seizing the parchment, was gliding back again from whence she came. But Ambrose Duval gave the hiss of a snake as he saw the precious paper being taken from his grasp, and with a half-articulate cry of rage and terror, bounded forward. But Sir George was quicker than he, and ere he could reach the ghost or woman, he found himself pinioned in the Englishman's strong arms. 
Then the two men struggled, Ambrose Duval with mad fear in his breast at this new foe, and Sir George with cool determination to frustrate his opponent's ends. As they tottered together, they both saw, with an indescribable thrill, the figure disappear as it were before their eyes, into the darkness of the wall, and they knew they were alone. Was she a ghost, or real flesh and blood? That was a question which neither could decide. But now that there was no more reason to protect Esther, if it were she, Sir George let Mr. Duval go. He was breathless from rage and fright, and he staggered to a chair. How dare you attack me like this? He exclaimed furiously, drawing a revolver from his pocket and pointing it at his foe's face. But Sir George, far more perturbed at the thought of what might have become of his lady love, took no notice of him. He walked over to the fire and poked up the dying embers, which threw up a last small flame, giving enough light for him to find his candlestick, which he had put down beside the sofa in the gloom, beyond the shaft of moonlight. Mr. Duval followed him, still livid from fear of the supernatural, and mad with rage at his failure and loss. You shall answer to me for this, now, with your life, he snarled. In that case, you will be hanged for murder, Sir George retorted coolly. You had better go quietly in the morning, before I denounce you as a thief. I am no thief, Mr. Duval protested violently. How dare you attack a guest, in our friend's house, in this murderous fashion? It is I who can denounce you. You must give me satisfaction for this. I shall do nothing of the kind, said Sir George. I should not think of fighting a duel with a thief. Just take my advice, and go in the morning, without a scandal, and prosecute your scheming tricks elsewhere. I have seen all you did, remember, and can describe it well. Then the two men glared at one another, there in the old library, the one candle illuminating their angry faces, and the great shaft of moonlight lighting the rifled escritoire. And then Sir George calmed himself. You can take what course you please, he said. I am armed too. And he drew his small derringer from the pocket where he had been holding it. I am rather a good shot sometimes, so we may hit each other, but there is no use in it, and rats like you are fond of life. This reflection seemed to carry weight with Mr. Duval, unflattering as it was, for it is one thing to shoot at an unarmed man, and quite another to find him possessed of a pistol too. With what dignity he could, Mr. Duval now drew himself up and prepared to leave the room. You have won this time, he said between his teeth, but some day I will level things up. I am quite indifferent about that, Sir George answered hurriedly. Get out now and get away by the earliest train. I shall give you so much start, now I have other and more important matters to attend to. Go and he almost drove Duval to the door and up to his room. Then, when he had seen him safely shut in, he paused to think what was the next thing to be done. To awaken Jack Hardress and his wife, and ascertain if Esther was safe in her cedar chamber, seemed to be the best move. So, after some difficulty, he found his host's apartment and knocked firmly at the door. Yes, what is it? Jack Hardress called out sleepily, and Ada's frightened voice piped. Oh, who is there? Then Sir George explained in as few words as he could, when the host and hostess, clothed in dressing gowns, appeared in the passage, and they all three, 
carrying lights, set off for the cedar room. But here was deathly silence. No answer came to their knocks, nor could they enter. The door was locked from within. A sickening icy hand clutched at Sir George's heart. What had happened? Some ill had befallen Esther. If we both rush the door together, we can break the lock, Jack, he said desperately. We must not delay an instant, now! And the two men hurled themselves against the stout panels, but though they shivered, they held. Then, with the strength of despair, Sir George made a rush by himself, and the bolt gave, and he fell headlong into the room. But. Alas, Ada's two candles, which she held high, revealed no occupant. The bed had been slept in and left hastily. The clothes were turned back, but there was no sign of Esther. The three people looked at each other with blanched faces. What mystery was here? Sir George began hastily to examine the walls. It followed, his common sense told him, if the door were locked from within, his beloved lady had left the apartment by some other means. The windows were out of the question, they were too high, and besides, were closed and the orange curtains drawn. There must be some secret panel, and Esther must have walked in her sleep, but how weird it all was and he was filled with dread and foreboding as he felt each part of the wall. We must discover the entrance, Jack, he said. I saw Mrs. Charters with my own eyes in the library, or her ghost, and she disappeared at the end of the room. Now, with terrified eagerness, the three set to work, feeling and tapping each cedar panel while Ada Hardress called continually, Esther, Esther, answer if you are there and can hear us. But only silence greeted them, and as the hopelessness of their task made itself felt, a sickening fear grew and grew in each of their hearts. What if she had fallen down some deep secret place, some oubliette, and were dead? They might pull all the house down and be too late. End of section four. Section five of The Urtonwood Ghost by Eleanor Glynn. Chapter two, part C. At last, Ada, almost weeping from grief and fright, subsided upon the sofa, while her husband and Sir George rigid and grey with anxiety, faced each other to decide what to do. Wake the servants and send for a mason and carpenter, Sir George said. And meanwhile, can't we get an axe and some tools? I will tear the woodwork down myself when I have an implement. Mrs. Hardress went off to wake the household and send for the required men. And get a doctor too. Sir George called, and when some tools were found by a frightened footman and brought, he set to work with such a will that at last a steel bolt was discovered, and, the panelling giving way by the fireplace, a very small narrow door was disclosed in the stonework. The bolts in connection with it were stiff and rusted with age, and how a delicate woman could have moved them was a profound mystery. The door gave way without much difficulty, and here, by the light of a lamp held high, the very narrowest passage was revealed, which in three paces developed into a stair. It was so extremely narrow that Sir George was obliged to force his broad shoulders through with great difficulty until he came to the descent which seemed to twist and then go along straight once or twice, not a winding turret stair. And suddenly, a 
at a sharp turn he could see the steps rising again on the opposite side but there in the space beneath lay the figure of a woman in white with an exclamation of anguish he saw that it was esther but was she dead he handed the lamp to jack hardress who was behind him and in a second he was beside his love and raising her in his arms with difficulty in the confined space and even in the excitement he noticed that she still clutched in her hand the paper which seemed to have been the cause of all the tragic events of the night he detached it from her fingers and saw that the blood drops had smeared her hand as he put the paper in his pocket and lifted her in his arms to carry her back a bruise marked where her forehead had struck a projecting stone in the wall perhaps she was only stunned and not dead this hope gave him the strength of a lion and he clasped her close but their exit was no easy task the space had been narrow enough for one person here and there and was impossible for a man cumbered with a woman in his arms jack hardress retreated before them holding the lamp high and when sir george came to a turn that he could not pass he was obliged to lay his precious burden down and to let jack hardress pull her through by the arms and then he lifted her up again and so at last all three were safe in the cedar room where a thrilled and excited group awaited them including the doctor who had now arrived the room was cleared of all but ada sir george and esther's maid while the doctor bent over the inanimate form at last he looked up and announced that no she was not dead and never were more grateful words sent up to heaven than sir george's fervent thank god she was not dead then his darling and soon she might open her dear eyes and look into his own he could afford to wait in the passage now as he told the good news to the rest of the alarmed guests and presently the doctor and mrs hardress came out and he heard that his beloved was conscious and would soon be well she must have walked in her sleep the physician said and her head struck a stone but it was the stifling air which made her faint though no doubt she was stunned too by the blow if you had been an hour later in finding her i think she could not have lived and so after all there were rejoicings on that christmas morning which seemed as though it were going to dawn so tragically and in the excitement of it all no one thought then to remark upon mr ambrose duval's departure by the one and only early train his note of farewell to his hostess was a masterpiece and caused sir george to smile as she handed it to him to read late in the afternoon he was allowed to see his loved lady in ada's own sitting-room alone and in peace she was lying upon the sofa with a bandage round her forehead and her small face looked ghastly pale against the blue silk cushions but her eyes shone and she stretched out her hands as he bent upon his knees to be near her george you were good to me she whispered and i can't take care of myself but she could not say any more because he stooped and kissed her lips and for some while they were too happy to talk of even a subject so interesting as her dream and the adventure it produced but at last they became sane enough to examine the parchment which proved to be the certificate of marriage between john charters bachelor and marjorie wildacre spinster celebrated at a little village in leicestershire in the year 1795 so 
the Urtonwood ghost had stood Esther in good stead, for here was her fortune secured beyond any doubt. But who, then, was Mr. Ambrose Duval? And what was his connection with the affair? And why did Esther herself resemble the picture of the Urtonwood ghost? These were questions which it would take time to discover the answers of. What does anything matter? exclaimed Sir George after a while. Since I have enough for us both, and since you cannot take care of yourself, you are going to let me try. It was not before the happy pair returned from their honeymoon that all the mystery was unravelled. The lawyers had been busy investigating the while. It appeared that Lady Marjorie Wildacre had lived at Urtonwood, which was her old home, her father having sold it when they went to Italy. She had had a daughter by her second husband, the Italian Count, who eventually married the great-grandfather of Esther, thus carrying the likeness into her family. And Esther often loves to weave a romance round her dream and imagine how, influenced by this far-back ancestress's unquiet spirit, she must have been drawn to go to the Urtonwood Christmas party and participate in the events which followed. The poor lady, she decided to think, repenting of her heartlessness to her charter's son, had brought the dream to her great-grandchild and led her through the secret passage to claim her own, so that she, the Lady Marjorie, might rest in peace. You see, George, she probably loved the Italian Count, Esther told her husband, and wanted their descendant by him to benefit too. That is why she directed me. But I cannot help being sorry for poor Mr. Duval. Loathsome foreigner, was all Sir George said. His real name was Charters, and he was the claimant of the fortune. But he chose to take his mother's name. She had been a Frenchwoman. The better to pursue his investigations unsuspected. He had got hold of some letter among his branch of the family papers which referred to the certificate being at Urtonwood, and Lady Marjorie's residence there. And, hearing that his chance acquaintances, the Hardresses, had taken this place, he cultivated them in order to have access for his search, determining, when he found the certificate, he would destroy it, and then with certainty prosecute his claim. But fate takes care of things and arranges what she thinks best and even the thoroughly english sir george seafield is obliged to own that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in our philosophy end of section five and end of the urtonwood ghost by Eleanor Glynn. Thank you for listening.